Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As it is the top of the hour, we're going to get going with our presentation here. Uh, my name is Isaac Sorensen. I'm the National Architectural Sales Manager with WR Meadows based in the northeastern U.S. near New York City. Uh, thank you for joining us today, uh, wherever you are, East Coast, West Coast, early, late. We appreciate your time. Our presenter today is uh, Mr. Scott Wolf. And uh, Scott is our Midwestern dedicated architectural services rep uh, based in the Chicago area. Uh, before I pass over the presentation to Scott, I just wanted to go over a few things uh, with all of you. So everyone will be muted for the duration of the presentation. If you have questions, mm -hmm. uh, please put questions into the Q&A box and double check that you're addressing your questions to quote all panelists. Uh, we will be monitoring the Q&A and we'll be attempting to answer your questions in real time. However, if your question requires a lengthier explanation or is a bit more complex, uh, we may hold on to them until the end of the presentation to answer verbally, or we may need to get in touch with you afterward uh, via email for a longer explanation. Uh, this is an AIA accredited presentation. Everyone will be receiving certificates sent to the email address you provided to us at registration. And if you included your AIA number, we will also be submitting these credits directly to the AIA. And lastly, on your screen, you'll see an email address um, probably uh, throughout the presentation or at the end of the presentation, uh, info at wrmeadows.com, where of course we have our presenters information up on the screen currently, um, Mr. Scott Wolf. Um, if you'd like a copy of the presentation or would like to get in touch with your local rep or have any additional questions uh, in the future, we would welcome them. Just shoot us an email at info at wrmeadows.com and we'll certainly get you whatever you're uh, interested in. At this point, I'd like to turn over this presentation to Mr. Scott Wolf. And uh, thank you, Scott, for uh, presenting today. Go ahead. Isaac, thanks a lot. Appreciate the uh, the introduction. Um, yes, as uh, Isaac said, I am Scott Wolf. I'm uh, based in the Midwest, and uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, yeah, while we encourage uh, inquiries, I'm happy to address any questions. My email address is on the bottom of the screen, uh, along with my mobile phone. Um, I'm on mute. Can everybody hear me, Isaac? Is that all right? You're good. Okay, all right. I just I saw someone said I was on mute, so I got a little panicky. So um, anyway, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, email me direct or or just as Isaac acknowledged, uh, info at uh, wrmeadows.com. Uh, happy to address this. This is a pretty deep dive uh, program, and I realize there's a lot of information. So uh, if anybody's interested in a you know, one on one, I'm, I'm happy to review this at any point in time. So feel free to email me. Um, I want to start out, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, just some acknowledgments about uh, this this information presented today. Uh, a lot of this is is based on uh, obviously a lot of uh, uh, empirical data that's that's available today uh, online and in in seminars, having attended seminars, and most especially, I want to kind of give a shout out to. Uh, you know, those architects and consultants in my region and my CSI colleagues as well. I, I've really gleaned a lot of information from uh, these folks in my network. Uh, so for based on that, I, I encourage uh, anybody interested in this this uh, this uh, question for the ages to uh, reach out to to your your uh, your, your network colleagues. So uh, great, great resources there. <clears throat> Pardon me. So let's go ahead and jump in. Got a lot of stuff to cover. Um, learning objectives today are going to hopefully provide a, a, a knowledge of correct terminology, uh, definitions, specification language. It all starts with the specs, of course. Uh, reviewing uh, typical material properties in exterior walls. Uh, this is one of probably one of the the, the, the core things that I'm, I'm going to really discuss in, in detail. Uh, we'll also explore airberry types, compositions, and their differing reactions to moisture exposure. Um, and another core 
uh, tenant, uh, so to speak, is designing for optimum drying. Uh, it's not it's never a question of if walls get wet. They're going to get wet through any number of drive mechanisms, either inward to outward, outward to inward. And last, of course, is to hopefully uh, uh, many will come uh, uh, away from this uh, program to understand a base, get a baseline of understanding of when to consider permeable or non-permeable. So let's jump in here. Um, so um, what is a vapor permeable air barrier? Uh, simply an air and water impermeable material, but one that is water vapor uh, permeable. So in essence, what we're, what this, descri this description is, is basically uh, any material that is air resistant, water resistant, but allows water vapor in the form of a, a gas to migrate through the membrane. Um, I always like to use, if I can use a proprietary name here, um, I always like to describe vapor permeable air barriers as, as Gore-Tex, essentially. I think others have probably used the same, same uh, uh, analogy. Um, it stops air and water, but if, if uh, we sweat, it allows the water vapor, in, uh, again, in the form of a gas, to migrate through the membrane. Vapor retarding air barrier is one that is also air resistant, water resistant, and but one that's also water vapor resistant, and we'll drill into uh, the deeper question about different vapor retarding membranes. Um, so this is the, the lowest uh, lowest permeance uh, type of material. Um, and I'm probably going to repeat this as well, but but uh, air barriers are water resistant. Air barriers are not considered waterproofing. This is something I, I get a little uh, little up in arms over. So uh, just keep that in mind. ASTME 2178, probably very familiar to most everybody on the call here. Um, is really the standard test method uh, for determining air permeance of individual materials. So an individual material, again, just the material that, that acts as an air barrier, allows no more than four thousandths of a cubic foot per minute uh, of air, per, uh, air permeates through the uh, membrane based on a 1.57 pound per square foot or 75 pascal load. E96 is also the standard test method for determining uh, water vapor transmission material. So it's going to evaluate water vapor again in the form of a gas that gets to the individual material that is acting as, as of course, the air barrier. So water vapor permeates. Uh, water vapor permeates, this uh, lengthy description, is the time rate of water vapor transmission through unit area of a flat material or construction induced by unit vapor pressure a difference between two specific surfaces under a specific temperature and humidity conditions. So in other words, uh, vapor pressure delta between inside and outside environments for, for uh, basically for a, a, a combined de definition. So PERMS uh, is the unit measurement for the, water, for the amount of water vapor that will pass through a given area of material over a, period, a specified period of time. So in other words, the U.S. PERM is defined as one grain of water vapor per hour per square foot per inch of mercury. So really, I, I always like to, to connote that PERMS of uh, permeance, PERMS and water and grains of water are really synonymous with each other. Um, so it takes basically 59,000 grains of water to equal one gallon. So if 59,000 grains or 59,000 perms equals one gallon, if we're looking at a membrane or material that has a, 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 is evaluated as one grain or one perm or even lower than that, we can see that that's probably not a lot of, it's not gonna allow a lot, very much water vapor to get through that material. So when we're talking about perms, and we're talking at like one perm or even lower than that, um, we're not really seeing a lot of uh, water vapor getting through the membranes. So and this will make sense as we, as we uh, move into the uh, rest of the PowerPoint. What is a vapor retarder? Um, a water vapor resistant material or construction with water vapor permeance values as described in chapter two of the code, um, as we'll see at the bottom here. And um, I'm going to use the term vapor retarder because it's 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 technically correct. The term vapor barrier, which is has and continues to still be used today in specifications, on documents, on drawings, uh, is really the same thing as a vapor retarder. Uh, it's technically incorrect. No material is a, is a barrier given enough pressure and time. All materials, I don't care what they are, 
um, will will allow water vapor, but again, it, it's it's pre it's it's pressure and time. So um, in the code, in chapter two of the code under definitions, vapor retarders are broken into three classifications. Class one is the most restrictive of these, and a class one vapor retarder is going to have again as we we just looked at the the uh, definitions of of perms um, a class one vapor retarder is going to have a water vapor permeance value of one tenth of one perm or less um, it is the most restrictive class two is going to be have basically less than one perm but uh, not lower than one tenth of one perm so class one and class two and i'm going to probably repeat this throughout but class one and class two re uh, vapor retarders are for all intents and purposes uh, what we've been calling a quote vapor barrier over over the last 70 plus years that we've been using you know poly vapor barriers so in fact chapter 14 of the code uh, basically identifies class one and class two vapor retarders as those that have have you know for a long time been used on the quote warm and winter side of the insulation class three vapor retarder um, is a term that i'm not i've never been really uh, fanciful for uh, for um, it to me anything that's uh, that's described as a vapor retarder to me sounds like it's vapor restrictive but um, again by by definition uh, class three vapor retarders as we see here has a water vapor permeance above 1.0 perms but less than 10 perms um, so vapor retarders, uh, for, all, for all intents and purposes, are, are vapor impermeable. So they will also act as effectively an air barrier, um, as, as identified by the IECC. I added this slide here just for information's sake. Uh, this is all reference. Uh, it's, it's a lot of, lot of words to, to keep describing continuous exterior insulation. Uh, many uh, put put uh, this in, in drawings on specs uh, as, as CI, well, probably not specs, but uh, CI just stands for continuous exterior insulation, this stuff, um, or closed cell spray foam can also be used in the same manner, but uh, uh, spray foam insulation is abbreviated as SPF. Extruded polystyrene, again, XPS uh, is pink or blue typically. Um, abbreviated as XPS, uh, and I, I did include EPS, extruded polystyrene, as I don't really see this used in exterior wall assemblies, save, of course, perhaps maybe in, in exterior insulating and finished systems. But uh, polyisocyanurate is uh, typically referred to as, as polyiso, and that's that's the uh, sort of yellow beigey stuff that is uh, of even a, a, a tighter uh, matrix uh, than even the, the pink or the blue uh, type of uh, insulations. So what's in a name? Uh, the many monikers of air barriers. Um, this is what I think many probably see on, uh, again, on drawings and on specs. And I, I'm, I'm just not, I, I think uh, we as an industry, uh, we manufacturers uh, will, will take, the, take some of the blame. Um, unfortunately, use far too many different uh, titles that basically mean virtually the same thing. You know, people say, I want to learn about your air and vapor barriers, air and water barriers, air and moisture barriers, weather barriers, weather resistant barriers, AVBs, uh, AWBs. I've seen it all on, on drawings. Just know that air barriers are just that. They are air restrictive, they're water restrictive. And per, um, per I'll use uh, uh, AI's master spec, for example, which uh, I appreciate, uh, you know, there are shortcomings in, in all platforms, but. Uh, master spec uh, defines air barriers as simply in two categories, and I love this about it. So uh, air barriers are either vapor retarding or vapor permeable. So, you know, to use the uh, master format spec sections 072726 for fluid applied membrane air barriers, they title them fluid applied membrane air barriers, comma, vapor retarding or fluid applied membrane air barriers comma vapor permeable so uh, that's what I when I'm reviewing specifications um, I will if I see any of these monikers there I'll, I'll, I'll try to redirect and use the industry's um, the language that will again uh, we'll drill into here in just a few moments so um, so again on that note um, CSI's master format air barrier specification language uh, these are probably the, the most common that we see. Of course, uh, certainly not uh, not includes all of them, but a modified bituminous sheet air barrier is just simply the, the typical 40 mil, um, you know, HDPE carrier film or aluminum faced uh, type of air barrier. 
Typically, those are vapor retarding. Plastic sheet air barriers, board product air barriers, those integrally bonded uh, air barriers, which in many cases tend to be vapor permeable. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, fluid applied membrane air barriers, uh, again, vapor permeable or vapor retarding. Um, I, this is the, the language that I like to see when I'm um, reviewing and marking up uh, specifications. Um, and, uh, and then spray foam air barriers. Um, spray foam is qualified, uh, again, like many products, like many materials, as qualified as being an air barrier. Um, but we'll go into that in another PowerPoint. So air barriers are, again, I'm going to hammer this home, air barriers are barriers to the uh, movement of air. They're air restrictive. Uh, they're water resistant. They're not waterproofing. Um, and again, they fall into these, these two categories. So, so bottom line is, you know, which, which do I use, permeable or non-permeable? And, you know, we don't, we're not here to, to be kitschy about this, um, but it, it's the, 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 excuse me, the decision to use permeable versus vapor retarding, it really depends on many things. And it's going to depend on, you know, the construction type, the materials within the wall assembly, uh, the building use, etc. So uh, a permeable air barrier, and again, this is just a, a good slide to identify, sort of show what, what a permeable air barrier is. Um, and again, it's like a Gore-Tex jacket. So it's, it's air resistive, it's water penetration resistant, uh, but allows water vapor to migrate through. Whereas a vapor retarding air barrier is resistant to air, water, and water vapor. And uh, to put everything in perspective, air molecules versus water vapor molecules, we can see that water vapor molecules are, are far larger than, than air molecules. And this is something that, that I, I recently got into a discussion with, uh, uh, with a, an architect out west. Uh, it was kind of confusing uh, water vapor resistance versus air resistance. So uh, just know that all air barriers are going to be water resistant. Uh, again, think, think like Gore-Tex. Uh, versus, uh, you know, maybe a poly raincoat, if you will, just to try to use some more uh, analogies here. So, so all right, so um, the permeance decision, um, again, it's going to depend on, uh, you know, first thing I always get when, when some, somebody contacts me and, and they'll ask me, you know, what kind of insulation, or sorry, what t type of air barrier should I use, you know, permeable, non-permeable, I always start with, well, what type of insulation are we using? Uh, like, where is it, it within the, the overall wall assembly? Um, what's the building type? What's the intended use? Uh, most often we, we are working with, you know, uh, office buildings, uh, multi-unit family development, uh, uh, hospitality, hospitals, museums, libraries, things of that nature, um, where we're maintaining pretty much a same, more or less same type of conditions, roughly 72 uh, degrees F, uh, plus or minus a few, and roughly 30, 35 degrees uh, RH. Um, the geographic location, where, where's, where's the project located? Uh, the, wind, the wall material, uh, the window to wall ratio, uh, you know, uh, paper mills uh, and natatoriums, these are high humid environments. Um, the, these have uh, put substantially greater uh, uh, needs on, on the exterior wall, uh, more so than, than, again, a multi-unit or a, uh, an office building for that, for that matter. So permeability driving factors, again, uh, the type of insulation, are we using spray foam insulation? Um, if we use closed cell spray foam insulation um, and we use it on the outside, that, that's basically going to be essentially, for all intents, our, our, our vapor retarder, uh, i.e. our vapor barrier. So uh, are we just simply insulating the wall with, uh, with bad insulation, uh, glass bad insulation? Uh, open cell foam plastic, uh, typically SPF. Uh, which is basically vapor diffuse open, same as, as bad insulation. Uh, bad insulation is highly permeable. Um, again, where, where the insulation occurs within the overall wall assembly. Is it all on the outside of the wall or is it a combination of, uh, uh, is, there, are, are, is there equal amount of, of uh, uh, insulation between our framing if we happen to have a framed building uh, along with the, the exterior CI um, or is it uh, all the insulation on the interior side? These are all the questions that we, we need to first start with. And, and last and most important, of course, here is, is the water vapor permeance of all the materials. Um, what type of uh, interior finishes do we have? Um, is, is somebody specifying a poly vapor retarder behind the interior drywall? We've been doing that for 70, 75 years. 
Uh, keep in mind, and it's very, very important, if we if we specify a poly vapor retarder behind the interior drywall in six mil polyethylene film, and we also happen to have a layer of, say, an inch and a half or greater in thickness of this, this pink or this blue insulation on exterior as our exterior CI, um, this material uh, basically becomes a vapor retarder at an inch and a half or greater in thickness. So if we have a vapor retarder on the outside of a wall and we specified a six mil poly vapor retarder uh, on the interior side of our wall on the quote warm and winter side of the insulation, we've now set up a, a double vapor barrier condition. And this is one of the, the big things that, that I hope uh, if, if anybody comes away from this program with, with uh, remembering anything, uh, is to avoid the double vapor barrier condition or double vapor retarder condition. It's, it's, it's so important. Um, so it's why I always uh, strongly recommend that, that exterior walls are, are definitely coordinating with the interior design team to make sure that the interior finishes, you know, uh, uh, vinyl covered wallpaper, uh, oil based paint, uh, uh, epoxy paints. These are all vapor retarders uh, as, you know, if, if we have a vapor impermeable uh, rigid insulation or, or exterior CI, uh, that could set up a very bad problem. Um, I'll just cite an example. Um, uh, probably about uh, 12, 14 years ago, I had a, uh, 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 a consultant contact me about a project in Michigan, and the building he was working on was uh, probably seven years into service. It was not a very old building. This was, again, a long time ago uh, before the code mandated the exterior CI. And the it was just a typical six inch uh, metal stud, I believe it was, uh, bad insulation between the framing, uh, interior drywall, and they had a six mil poly vapor retarder behind the interior drywall because that's what chapter 14 of our code says. Um, but unfortunately, the builder or and or designer, I don't, he never, I never got that much into the uh, the backstory. But uh, whoever built this uh, exterior wall also put a 40 mil ice and water type of roof dam uh, membrane, which is also a vapor retarder, a very low class one vapor retarder on the exterior side in lieu of a quote building wrap. So not only did we have a poly behind the interior drywall, we also had a, an impermeable membrane on the cold and winter side of the insulation. Now again, the, the conventional uh, uh, wisdom is, is that we put a vapor permeable air barrier on the quote cold and winter side of the insulation. This particular project, um, the, the building occupants, it was an insurance headquarters, um, noted that every spring, and again, this is climate zone five, every spring, this wall would eventually start bleeding and soaking the carpeting several feet in from the exterior wall, and they could never figure out why. And the, in fact, the, the wetting was so bad that the gypsum drywall on the interior side started to literally decompose. Um, and of course, they, they in fact uh, forensically investigated this wall and found that uh, indeed they had a, a, a impermeable, a vapor retarder uh, in the wrong side of the wall when they should have used something that was vapor diffuse open. So long and the short of that is that they kept, they had to rebuild the wall uh, much as it was originally designed, but instead of using a non-permeable um, membrane on the exterior side, they used a, a, a vapor permeable self-adhering membrane on the exterior side, because we need to allow the walls the ability to, to breathe and dry. So that's a perfect example of where, you know, a vapor permeable air barrier would be used. So, sorry, a little soapbox, a little backstory there. Um, so the four control layers, um, the four control layers in, in, in building envelope uh, are air, water, water vapor, and thermal. And the first three are, are uh, often found or combined within one membrane. Uh, they could be fluid applied, they could be self adhering sheet again, or they could be any number of these types of insulations that can qualify as all four control layers. So, um, so all right, um, location of primary thermal layer. Uh, again, this is the one of the first things I always try to, to identify is where this insulation is going to occur. Um, I'm if I can uh, be uh, offer up a uh, uh, a suggestion. There's a there's a seminal article, and this is not the uh, the sexy uh, cover, but uh, article titled "Understanding Vapor Barriers" is what these uh, these uh, details are drawn from. But detail on the left is basically uh, putting all of our thermal insulation uh, on the exterior side again in the form of, of CI, and what this this is doing is basically 
uh, putting, you know, the entire structural wall above the dew point. And I'm, I'm assuming that, that probably, hopefully, everybody is aware of and familiar with what the dew point is. The dew point is simply when the temperature drops, the humidity levels will rise and where the two points intersect, where the humidity level hits 100% RH, um, is basically when the air can no longer support that, that water vapor load and it, it results in the form of condensation. Now the dew point uh, is, is that which typically occurs at, around, or generally within the primary thermal layer. Um, and I, I say that not to be evasive or anything, but the, the dew point is, is, you know, we could draw it in a simple static vertical line. That'd be real convenient and easy for us. But the reality is that the dew point, like, like I say, occurs at, around, or generally within the primary thermal layer. Um, if anybody's ever um, experienced a, a hydrothermal, uh, quote, woofy type of, of uh, wall analysis, the dew point in reality oscillates back and forth. Uh, due to the ever-changing ambient conditions, mostly on the exterior side, but the majority of, of that dew point occurrence is again going to occur primarily within the, the thermal layer. And if we have a closed cell uh, type of insulation like this, and it's on the outside of our building, uh, and that's where the majority of our dew point moisture condensation is, is occurring, that's a great place, and that's certainly where we want to keep all of the, the water vapor on the outside. So uh, long and the short of this, this detail on the left, um, this, this is the most, far away going to be the most expensive wall to, to construct because it creates a deeper foundation, longer masonry ties that have to reach through. But if we take all of our insulation and we happen to use a closed cell uh, type of insulation on the exterior side of our wall, um, we can typically marry that with a vapor retarding air barrier. And as it's, it's, we can see on this, this detail here, it says membrane or trowel on or spray applied. Um, he's calling it a vapor barrier, class one vapor retarder from our, our earlier discussion, air barrier and drainage plane. So we have a basically a class one air barrier on the exterior sheathing. And then we have basically a class two vapor retarding rigid insulation. When we bond those two together, this now becomes again, our, our environmental separation or our, our four primary control layers. So um, this is really the easiest wall, in my humble opinion, uh, to determine uh, to go with, say, a, a vapor retarding air barrier. Now, if we move to the middle detail, uh, which is, again, I'm going to call this the old fashioned wall. I don't really see this wall used very much uh, these days, uh, probably mostly in residential construction, although I'm starting to see a little bit of uh, CI used in, in residential construction. Um, but again, um, we have the vapor permeable uh, air barrier, you know, it's called a building paper or, or house wrap. In fact, uh, the IBC does acknowledge building paper as, as being the lowest common denominator and, and qualified air barrier, water resistive layer. Um, but we noticed that the interior side, we would, we would typically use a, a vapor retard. At least this is what Chapter 14 of the code still acknowledges unless a, 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 a hydrothermal uh, wall modeling analysis is performed on that wall. Um, but we can also move to the detail on the right, which now is, is what many of us refer to as the quote, hybrid wall assembly, where we have both bad insulation and exterior CI. Um, and, but for, for this article, uh, per this, this detail here, again, it's calling out a vapor retarding air barrier. Um, now, if we were to have, again, I'll cite another um, case study I was involved uh, probably 15, 16 years ago. Uh, project architect in Chicago was designing a, uh, uh, a medical facility. It was a, a university hospital on the Gulf Coast, and I believe it was in, in uh, Baton Rouge, or was it, I think it was in Louisiana. So obviously climate zone two or perhaps one. And Architect had basically this wall, uh, six inch uh, structural metal exterior wall, um, and she had uh, already specified bad insulation, vapor diffuse open, again, a class three interior finish. Um, and the project team had one inch of extruded polystyrene, again, pink or blue stuff, um, and one inch of XPS insulation is just inside of a class three vapor retarder. Uh, the project team uh, ran this wall through a hydrothermal uh, woofy uh, wall analysis 
and found that their dew point on average occurred right at that demarcation line where they had specified a vapor permeable air barrier because again we have a vapor permeable rigid insulation at one inch or less the, of the pink and the blue um, and so they, that was what they came up with. They decided, well, we want a vapor permeable air barrier here. Um, but the design team had, uh, frankly, a little bit more money in the budget, and they wanted to increase the thermal uh, performance of this wall assembly. And they decided to go from one inch of extruded polystyrene XPS to two inches, which obviously, is, as I mentioned, drops it well it probably into a mid class two vapor retarder. They ran it through a second hydrothermal uh, wall analysis and found that their dew point, in fact, did get pushed further out into the cavity, further away from that interstitial space between the framing. Um, and in that uh, analogy, they, they reversed course and decided, well, let's use a vapor retarding air barrier. Uh, it was a fluid applied uh, based on, on the, the hydrothermal wall modeling. So just an interesting case study uh, that, that we, you know, that we can see uh, to discuss. So again, as I mentioned, uh, keeping structural wall components above the dew point is really an, an ideal uh, thing to have. Um, but the, the reason somebody might go with this, this hybrid wall assembly is to reduce the overall thickness, uh, the footprint, if you will, of the, of the overall wall assembly. But if we can accommodate putting all the CI on the exterior of a, of a wall, then it puts the entire structural uh, wall above the dew point, uh, keeps all of the, the most important elements, the structural elements, again, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it, high and dry. Uh, that's really going to be the, the great way to go. Um, I, I will make one last uh, mention here that the, the first and the third details on this page per this article suggest that these wall assemblies are are uh, applicable in all hydrothermal regions. So we, we've seen these walls in, in, in uh, climate zones five, six, and seven. I've seen them in, in mixed humid, hot humid, like St. Louis, uh, I think Austin, uh, along the Gulf Coast. So um, it, it is interesting to, to, to see that this, this industry article uh, does suggest that. Now, I wanna point out one last little thing here and the last little detail of all three of these uh, details here where it says latex paint or vapor semi permeable wall finish. The term vapor semi permeable is what the code identifies or uh, describes a class three vapor retarder. Class three vapor retarders are defined as vapor semi permeable. So I just, in, in reading this article, I just uh, made the connection of that with the uh, definitions in chapter two of the code. So, so many say I want, I want a permeable air barrier so my walls can breathe and dry. And that's all well and good. Um, I, I don't want to, again, be dismissive here, but manufacturers aren't really uh, in the position to say, you need to use this, you need to use this. We can certainly provide the information and, and uh, the empirical data that's out there. Um, be aware of other factors that might make that perhaps maybe not necessarily the best decision. Uh, be concerned about inward vapor drive um, or uh, you know, whenever we're, we're designing with, quote, moisture sen uh, sensitive materials, um, wood framing, uh, OSB, plywood, anything that has cellulose that might be a, a, a good food source for mold spores, um, even metal framing can get uh, compromised through, through long term moisture exposure. Um, I'll, I'll cite another example. Um, you know, uh, one of my CSI colleagues um, with, with whom I've, I've discussed this subject so many times over the years, um, but uh, his he's a hydrothermal wall modeling, works for a large uh, architecture engineering firm in Chicago, um, to discuss the, the subject of reverse water va vapor migration. And um, so if we, if we take the, the detail on the right here, for example, uh, if we have a vapor permeable air barrier um, and we have, um, you know, uh, a water storage cladding like we see on the left here, um, the detail on the right, of course, has more moisture sensitive materials. Gypsum panels, I don't care if they're water resistant um, uh, or any, for that matter, uh, are not infallible to degradation and damage over the long term. Um, the drying potential of a wall that has all of the insulation on the outside uh, that use the vapor permeable air barrier 
um, has to be concerned about inward vapor drive. Again, the greater the temperature delta and the greater the vapor pressure delta between outside and inside, the greater the drive mechanism. So um, in this one example that we were talking about, when all the insulation was on the outside, um, and a vapor permeable air barrier was used. This was a, this project, I believe he was working on, I wanna say it was in Austin, it was in Texas somewhere. But um, if we have a vapor permeable air barrier, and you'll have to forgive me, I don't have uh, two, two pieces of, of uh, blue insulation, but if we have a vapor permeable air barrier, all of our thermal insulation on the exterior side of our walls, and for example, if we don't tape the joints and a vapor permeable air barrier is used behind it, again, remember all the insulation on the outside of the, the structural backup wall, um, inward vapor drive uh, can have the potential to re-wet or, or introduce water vapor migrating through a permeable air barrier to the moisture sensitive GIF sheathing um, and the drying potential of that uh, in certain climate zones uh, is not on the order order of uh, hours, days, or weeks uh, from his, his studies, he's found that the drying before the, the point at which the, the gypsum has fully released uh, and achieved equilibrium of, of dryness uh, is uh, in some cases two to three months for that gypsum to fully dry out. Um, so if we, if we have a, you know, it's, it's uh, 85 degrees and uh, it's 11 a.m. and the clouds well up and they dump an inch and a half of rain. Um, in an hour and a half, the, the clouds break, the, the sun comes back out, temperature shoots up to 95 degrees. So we have 95 degrees F on the outside and we have 72 degrees on the inside and we're the air, running the air conditioning, we're dehumidifying and we're about 30% RH. So given our water storage cladding like we see on the left, we have uh, basically achieved a 100% RH condition on the outside. And we have, you know, so 100% RH here, 30% RH on the inside. Um, uh, temperature, just like water vapor uh, pressure, is always going to seek its equilibrium, high to low in, in both cases. So um, if we have the ability for that water vapor to migrate through a permeable membrane, we have the potential to re-wet a moisture-sensitive material. Now, now, CME is perhaps maybe a little bit less uh, moisture sensitive, um, but um, not, nonetheless, I've, I've seen instances where it's uh, it's been compromised. So um, anyway, I'll uh, move on here because uh, get a little long winded here. Um, so choosing non vapor permeable um, in, in, in some cases when we have uh, both uh, the hybrid wall where we have both a combination of, of uh, uh, bad insulation between framing and exterior CI, if the majority or the higher R value, the general uh, convention is that if the highest R value or the higher R value resides in the form of exterior CI, uh, then, then typically we might be uh, capable or, or consider a non-vapor permeable, a vapor retarding air barrier. Uh, if we have perhaps maybe an average of, of uh, uh, same R, R value of insulation, both in, in CI and bad insulation. Um, uh, again, I've, I've seen non-permeable used in that instance, but if there's higher R value in the form of that, that insulation between our framing, um, and then in that instance, uh, some might, might go with a, a vapor permeable uh, air barrier. So, um, so vapor barrier on the warm in winter side of the insulation. Again, that's, that's something I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, but this is still in our code. Uh, class one and class two vapor retarders shall be provided on the interior side of frame walls in climate zones five and higher, including Marine four. Um, now the little passage at the bottom here uh, is what I, I started to, to touch on here uh, based on this wall assembly or an approved design using accepted engineering practice for hydrothermal analysis, i.e. The, the WOOFI or the hydrothermal analysis. Um, if uh, the, these walls, uh, with the, the, there's a question about where, where the dew point's going, going to occur or whether or not I, I should be using a vapor retarder uh, be, be behind our interior drywall um, in, on the warm and winter side of the insulation. Um, if there's any, ever any question, uh, hydrothermal wall analysis can, can be provided. And I think a good example of that is, is the, uh, the case study that I was involved in uh, when I was early into this, uh, this industry. Uh, with that Chicago architect working on that project in in uh, on the Gulf Coast. So, uh, but this is this is what we have now. If we have again 
the rigid insulation acting as the class one and class two vapor retarder, uh, the case can be made for, for using this now as our primary, uh, quote, uh, vapor barrier in the warm and winter side of the insulation. So again, uh, do not use, uh, try to avoid the, the uh, use of poly vapor retarders behind the interior drywall when we have rigid insulations uh, that are act basically acting as the, the quote, vapor retarder uh, per the code. So again, double avoid the double vapor barrier condition. Um, uh, 2015 uh, was the, the first year this passage uh, was added to the code, and I, I was elated to, to find it. Um, keep in mind that the code language, and, and uh, I've confirmed with other people way smarter than me, um, that the code language is, uh, suffice it to say, uh, rather difficult to, to comprehend. But um, in, in reading this passage here, uh, it's basically saying that a class three vapor retarder, and again, remember from our, our earlier discussion, a class three vapor retarder is uh, above one perm, less than 10 perms. Uh, basically, that means a, a breathable type of finish. So whenever we have, what it's saying here, when our, our foam plastic insulating sheathing, our exterior CI has a perm rating less than one, um, everything from that point inward must be vapor diffuse open. So this passage, in essence, is, is telling us to avoid the double vapor barrier condition, if you'll pardon the expression here. So um, that's, uh, and I, I found that to, to, to be very nice. Now, the 2021 iteration of this is even more convoluted, but it more or less reads the same. So I just wanted to make that, that point. Um, so again, no interior poly vapor retarder when the exterior CI is less than 1.0 perms. Avoid vapor retarding interior finishes. Uh, even wallpapers can be uh, perforated and allow water vapor migration. Um, and in avoiding uh, vinyl covered wallpaper, uh, I remember going to a uh, hotel in the middle of August in St. Louis, and I, I was likely, I believed that this wall, which probably didn't have CI, but it, it, as soon as I, I went into the room, I could smell that, that musty vinyl, uh, almost moldy, nasty smell because it was very humid that day. But my guess is that the, the wallpaper was, was vapor retarding and there was probably a poly vapor retarder behind the interior drywall, basically sandwiching that, uh, that gypsum panel into in two impermeable surfaces. Again, the, the double vapor barrier condition. Uh, Oil-based and epoxy-based uh, paint finishes are also vapor retarding. So again, always coordinate with the interior design team when these, these types of conditions exist. Very, very important. So choosing vapor permeable. Uh, again, uh, the convention is that we use a vapor permeable air barrier on the cold and winter side of the insulation. Now, not to, to be contradictory, but if somebody wanted a vapor permeable air barrier on the warm in winter side of all of the exterior set, that's absolutely fine. Will, it, will the building turn into a pumpkin? After five years of service, probably not. But again, I think maybe if it's a critical use structure like a hospital, assisted living care facility, uh, maybe we'd want to see a, a hydrothermal wall modeling, you know, by a, by a consultant. But typically, a vapor permeable air barrier is that which is applied on the cold and winter side of the insulation. Perfect example is what we see here: these insulated sheathings, which commonly come with a bonded air barrier. Uh, that is vapor permeable. Um, polyiso type insulation, and in fact, even closed cell uh, minimum 1.5 cubic pound per square foot uh, spray foam, SPF, um, one inch or greater in thickness uh, is, is typically going to be just below 1.0 perms. Um, it's a, that, that much more efficient than the pink and the blue type of stuff. But, uh, but when we have uh, insulated sheathings, Yes, we would want to see a, a vapor permeable air barrier on that side. Um, it's interesting to me that uh, in the last several years, since these types of sheathings have become um, more common, um, I've had some architects, in fact, some builders ask, well, do we have a product that we could apply to this? And I try to remind them that, that you know, these products already come with an integral air barrier. In fact, even plywood and the OSB that they're bonded to, and even the even the ISO core uh, are also qualified, again, by the IECC as being an air barrier. 
Um, the only thing I'd be concerned about are the nail fastener penetrations. Uh, again, stopping bulk air leakage is always going to be the, the biggest goal of any air barrier. But, um, but if we take a permeable air barrier and apply another permeable air barrier on top of it, um, the, the reality is that we were likely to reduce the water vapor permeance of that membrane, thus defeating the reason why we want a permeable air barrier uh, on this sheathing. So I, I don't really advocate for that. I, I think if somebody wanted to, to, to just have a belt and suspenders and apply secondarily, I would, I would, I would avoid against it uh, and just be concerned about all of the sheathing to joint connections and the fastener penetrations and, of course, MEP penetrations. So, but again, cold and winter side of the insulation. Another uh, example of choosing a vapor permeable air barrier, um, if we do not have a, a, uh, uh, an air barrier on the structural deck at a parapet type condition, uh, and our primary air barrier is in fact the, the roofing membrane uh, that's wrapping up and over on top, uh, in this instance, we would probably want to use a, a, uh, a vapor permeable air barrier. This particular wall section happens to have uh, exterior uh, CI in the form of mineral wool, which is, is also vapor diffuse open. But again, we have one side of this being vapor retarding. So we would, again, we want to uh, allow the wall the ability to, to breathe and in essence uh, uh, have a high ability to, to dry. Um, also, um, you know, uh, our permeable air barriers to use, again, as I mentioned, beneath exterior CI, when all these CIs on the exterior, uh, you know, below uh, 1.0 perms, yes, absolutely. There, you know, again, there's, there's no harm, no foul there, but, but again, I, I would be concerned uh, in, in colder climates, for example, uh, the ability of that sheathing to dry out if it gets predisposed to wet. So again, as I mentioned earlier, um, when we look at this detail on the right, and we have our gyp sheathing, in the center line most, uh, in the center line or the centermost portion of this wall assembly, it's really in the center of the wall. So the ability of that of that uh, sheathing to to dry out uh, may take a pretty prolonged period of time. So um, you know, in in that case, you know, I, I'd be concerned about about its drying ability if we were to have exterior CI. Um, uh, outboard of this. Actually, I don't have a, a layer of exterior CI in the, on this detail. So again, the, the exterior CI is, is going to restrict um, drying. So in, in, as one of my colleagues used to say that, you know, if we have all of our insulation on the exterior side of our walls, uh, why not take the, air, air, the water vapor permits down to its lowest possible ability and protect that moisture sensitive material? So, but, uh, you know, there's certainly no, no problem with that, but uh, uh, maybe again, a hydrothermal uh, wall modeling might be uh, uh, warranted. Um, so what, uh, what permeance value is too high? This is just a sort of a, a dated reference. Uh, when, when air barriers really started to ramp up, uh, several manufacturers uh, produced products that were probably in the 250 to 400 perms range. And they found that that actually was, was detrimental because it allowed too much water vapor uh, introduced into the wall assembly. So, but again, uh, the code identifies vapor permeable membranes as those having water vapor permeance of five perms and higher. Um, when specifying perms, it seems most of the uh, specifiers use 10 perms as the minimum demarcation line for uh, minimum permeability, but, uh, but the code does identify five perms and higher as, as being the minimum uh, value here. So, Again, I talked about reverse water vapor migration, so I don't, I don't need to really spend much time on this. Uh, just be aware of moisture sensitive materials um, and you know, uh, where we have great temperature deltas. And, and I think uh, areas like North Dakota, areas that get substantial, even Minnesota for that matter, uh, where we get substantial temperature deltas. We could be in excess of 100 degrees during the summer and, and easily at 100% RH in the summer, but we could drop to, gosh, probably minus 40 degrees in the winter. So that's a pretty substantial delta and, and vapor pressure setup. So uh, we want to be concerned about uh, inward water vapor migration. Still unsure of choice. Again, I've, I've, mentioned, I've talked about this throughout uh, having a hydrothermal wall analysis performed. Um, I, I don't, I want to point out that, again, my CSI colleague um, gave me a, a head full of, uh, of information. He's, he's a big proponent for it, but uh, some of the, uh, the industry's leading uh, building science uh, people um, have expressed their less than, than uh, 
giddy uh, support for hydrothermal, they still perform them. Um, but it might, it might, you know, it provides a it pro provides some value, but it's not proof that the system works. It does not account for building materials as they age. It doesn't account for uh, incorrect or poor installation of the materials. Um, but it, it is a, a valuable tool, and and also it does only uh, define where the dew point is occurring at one fixed location in time. But we can certainly calculate for uh, the twelve months. Again, perfect uh, use for for hydrothermal. Wall analyses are, are you know, subarctic, arctic climates, equatorial climates, uh, unique conditions. Um, if somebody just wanted some uh, extra assurance for, for a, a project that's uh, maybe like a data center, uh, you know, a lot of uh, computer expensive computer equipment, healthcare, uh, museums, anything that's going to have to have a, a really uh, strict control on, on interior conditions uh, might uh, might be warranting uh, using these types of systems. Uh, chink in the armor, of course, uh, you know, we can do everything correct to the walls, but uh, I think this is something that thankfully the industry is addressing is the thermal conductivity of our cladding is sort of off subject here, but uh, I just felt compelled to, to uh, point this out. We do have a lot of uh, great products out there that are, are thermally broken and, uh, you know, fiberglass type of cladding connections, which are non-ferrous based, which uh, help reduce the, uh, the thermal bridging. Material, material permeance properties, uh, a lot of natural materials have uh, the ability to, quote, toggle uh, their water their reactions to water vapor permeance. Gypsum is, is a great example of this. Uh, gypsum panels, again, either gyp sheathing, interior drywall, um, act much like uh, what some manufacturers market as a, quote, smart vapor retarder. Uh, gypsum panels will actually uh, uh, reduce their water vapor permeance in lower relative humidities uh, down to 20 to 25 perms, but in the, the uh, exposure to higher relative humidities, their permeance values actually uh, goes up. So they're meaning that they allow uh, more water, water vapor egress into or out of the system. The same is held for, for uh, other natural materials like plywood and OSB, but um, I will point out that that OSB starts out already at a very low permeance value um, at, you know, rough, probably 50% RH at about 1.3, and that's largely due to the, the glues and the binders. Um, having sold <laughs> engineered wood panels many years ago, um, I, I, I learned that, uh, that OSB panels are much more highly predisposed to mold propagation, and that's really an effect of, of how they were uh, 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 built basically, so we take basically we we chop wood into uh, its you know into slivers, and we're uh, essentially exposing the the uh, the cellulose cores, uh, which are basically natural wood sugars, and then we we combine them with glues and binders, and then under heat and pressure we form these board products. Well, in in the heating process, this actually cooks out and brings out the natural wood sugars which of course mold spores uh, find very palatable. So I think many of us have seen OSB on, on uh, you know, sheds and even, in fact, I've seen them on uh, 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 structural insulated panels, excuse me, SIPs, um, that have, have not been on the building for too terribly long and they developed this, this black mold. So uh, I love engineered wood products for their dimensional stability, but uh, just be aware that they're, they're more highly predisposed. So if we take, uh, we go from, Dimensional lumber to plywood, plywood to OSB. As we move in that direction, we we uh, increase our potential for for uh, uh, these types of problems. Not to mention the the fact that uh, OSBs uh, can can expand unless uh, there are certain manufacturers that do make some pretty remarkable water resistant uh, OSB panels. But anyway, off subject. Other uh, yeah, this is from the uh, American Plywood Association. Um, just illustrates how plywood and uh, uh, OSB and plywood uh, to a greater extent will actually toggle in the right direction. In fact, uh, fluid applied air barriers um, are also act in, in very much a, a similar manner. Um, there's a very interesting uh, um, uh, industry article that discusses this in, in uh, greater detail. I'm happy to, to send it along if anybody's interested. So eliminating the poly vapor retarder, uh, plus or minus 2% uh, of vapor diffusion occurs through opaque materials. Uh, uh, CI may perform this function. In fact, I believe it does. Um, and, and poly vapor retarders are 15 times more restricted than required by code. 
Uh, in my humble opinion, I would love to see poly vapor retarders going away because, again, for all the different materials that we're using, uh, we already have uh, the the vapor retarder in other forms that uh, I think poly is is probably gotten us more into trouble than it has uh, attempted to resolve. And I, I don't believe I'm I'm alone in, in sharing that. Uh, uh, that aspect. And again, uh, the biggest objective of any bar air barrier system is to stop the bulk air leakage, i.e. taking care of all the transitional areas, the penetrations, because, you know, the key takeaway here is that 100 times more water vapor is carried through a small hole uh, than what is diffused through the uh, the opaque uh, opaque material. Oops, excuse me. Um, and this uh, quick snapshot of the common wall material water vapor permeance values of 6 mil poly um, I've seen them as low as 0 0.03 perms. Uh, OSB, again, very low. Plywood uh, is meeting the code definition of a vapor permeable air barrier. Gypsum panels, latex paint, uh, the aforementioned uh, XPS polyisos, um, and, and vinyl covered wallpaper. Again, designed for maximum drying. It's, it's never a question of if walls get wet, uh, they're going to get wet uh, through at any number of uh, at previously mentioned drive mechanisms. Um, and um, again, it, it really doesn't matter. I mean, if it's a, if it's a frame wall, a cold form metal frame wall, or or a, a CMU, um, CMU is is also subject to degradation. Uh, I think many of us have probably seen it firsthand here. Um, and a location of sensitive materials and their potential for drying. We we need to be at least aware of this. Uh, again, to, you know, be climate uh, dependent. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, in mixed humid, hot humid, uh, how, how quickly will that, that, uh, that sheathing dry out if it's in any, way, in any way exposed to the moisture? I'm going to make one last other mention here is that uh, the discussion about whether or not I should tape the joints of my rigid insulation, my exterior CI. I'm um, going to take another page from my CSI colleague, Glenn, um, who in the last several years has uh, decided or uh, leaning more towards leaning, leaving the, uh, the joints untaped to allow any residual moisture. Uh, it's going to be very small, but allow any residual moisture that might get be, you know, behind or within uh, the, uh, the insulation uh, out of the system through the weeps and the flashings. Now, keep in mind that rigid insulations have a finite amount of water absorption by, by volume, typically point three plus or minus so they're not going to be like a sponge and continue to absorb it uh, in fact they use uh, poly iso um, to uh, in in the uh, communication buoys in our in our world's ocean so they don't you know if they get damaged they're not going to take on water and sink to the bottom of the ocean for that matter so again a uh, couple of last few comments here i think i'm probably almost out of time uh, is hydrothermal wall, wall modeling. Again, uh, it does help uh, provide refinements to the original design. It's not a guarantee that the system works, however. Uh, does not account for application imperfections. Uh, does not account for building materials as they age. Uh, it is a great tool. It is rather expensive. Uh, the software at this point might cost ten dollars to $15,000. It's a two-week course for anybody to take the course. Um, and uh, But, you know, again, it's, it's, uh, it can provide uh, some assistance on the very early uh, design uh, phase of a, of a project. Um, ancillary note to uh, permeability is, is air, and, air and water infiltration through uh, the penetrations I, I mentioned earlier here. So um, material compatibility, um, that's uh, part and parcel, I think, to, to any air barrier discussion is just to make sure that, that air barriers are compatible. Uh, ideally, include all of the materials from one manufacturer, including through wall flashings, primers. Um, on the note of primers, I think uh, some might ask, well, if I have a self-adhering, uh, quote, peel and stick membrane and I use a primer, will that reduce my permeability if the air barrier, in this case, the self-adhering air barrier is vapor permeable? Short answer is yes, that reduces it, but not to the point where it would be uh, vapor retarding. So I think that's a question I get every once every year or so. Pre-construction meetings are, and commissioning are, are certainly a, a great uh, process to make sure that, that everything uh, mates up with each other and everything marries up uh, well, because obviously the wall to roof connections, wall to foundation connections uh, are, are some of my, uh, uh, my big points uh, to, to be concerned about. So in closing, air barrier permits decisions are driven by a number of factors, type and thickness of insulation, 
Where is that insulation lo uh, located within the overall wall assembly? Interior wall finishes, uh, uh, interior use, the building occupancy use, geographic location. Um, third party science forensic consultants, uh, uh, your CSI uh, uh, um, colleagues, manufacturers, technical reps, and, and again, there are a lot of articles out there that I, I think uh, provide really, really good uh, data um, that can be factored into the decision of using permeable or non-permeable. But um, with that, I'm going to stop and uh, uh, just give you the quick 30-second uh, uh, WR Meadows commercial. This is just a quick snapshot of all of our air barrier products and indeed some of our waterproofing products. Um, this is our product organizer. I'm happy to send out to anybody uh, who, who got my uh, email address at the top of the program. And we'll uh, stop right there, and I, I'll uh, turn it over to Isaac. Thank you.